The sermon text this morning is taken from Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. These are the words of the living God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, your word warns us against being foolish children who are driven about by every wave of doctrine, empty philosophies, and various faddish movements. We want to be mature in our faith, built up and rooted deeply in Christ. And so we ask you to give us the kind of hungry faith this morning that's ready to receive your word and then apply it to our lives so that we might be like the man who built his house on the rock. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a newer congregation, we're actually coming up on our our second birthday in April as an official church, Um, and uh, with, as I mentioned earlier, a whole bunch of newer people. Uh, I want to spend the next few weeks going over some of the basics of what we mean when we say we're Reformed. So for the next six Sundays, the series is, What is Reformed Anyway? What is Reformed Anyway? And... um, Historically, this name simply goes back to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. So think Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, that's that's what we're talking about. Historically, it goes back to the Protestant Reformation, but it is fundamentally based on the supremacy of God revealed in Scripture as the perfect word of God. Fundamentally, what we're talking about is simply the absolute conviction that God is supreme. God is absolute. God is majestic. God is over all. And, and, and so what we're saying is, uh, when we say we're reformed, is fundamentally to say that we want everything we think, say, or do to be God-centered. We want everything we say, think, or do to be oriented to him and to his perfect word. If he is ultimate, if he is absolute, if he is utterly supreme, then we want everything we say, think, and do to be oriented to him, obedient to him. This is fundamentally what we mean. Now, this is not to say that we have arrived. Sometimes the accusation, the slander comes against reform types. Oh, you guys think you know everything. You think you've got it all right. You don't think, you know. And unfortunately, there are some reform types that act like it. And so they Um, give some plausibility to the accusation. But that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that if God is supreme, if God is absolutely supreme, then he is worthy to have all of our lives oriented to him. If, If God is supreme, he is worthy to have every inch of our life, every second of our life oriented to him, not just two hours on Sunday, not, not just at small group, not just at Bible study, not just at psalm sing, not just at choir. No, he's worthy to have everything oriented to him. He's worthy to have all of life obedient to him. If he's, is he the supreme? Is he the supreme one over everything? Then, then he's worthy. So that's what we're saying. We're not saying we've arrived, but we're saying, man, we should try. <laughs> no, we haven't arrived, but he's worthy. He ought to have everything oriented to him. Everything ought to bring him glory. Everything ought to praise him and obey him. Now, as we do this, what we're talking about, what we're talking about is that we want to stand in the old paths. Uh, We want to hold fast to the faith once delivered for the saints. In many respects, all we mean is we just want old-fashioned Christianity. We just want vanilla Christianity. Old-fashioned Christianity is God is God, and we are not. So let's listen to him. Right? God is God and we are not, so let's obey him. Right? That's, that's old-fashioned Christianity. That's just regular Christianity. That's just vanilla Christianity. But, so, but, and this is what the Reformers did. The Reformers, John Calvin and Martin Luther and, and, and those, those types, 
um, basically, they were calling the Roman Catholic Church to repentance, and they were saying, guys, we've gotten off course. Guys, we've gotten off course. God is God, and we are not, and we should obey him. And here are some areas where we're not obeying him like we should. He's God, after all. We should obey him. You can't say, well, this is just how we've always done it. This is the tradition. This is how, so no, it needs to be authorized by God because we want everything to obey God. And what they did was they looked back and said, oh, look at our fathers in the faith, Augustine, Athanasius, Gregory the Great, and most significantly, the apostles themselves, the word of God itself, it says we ought to be doing it this way. We ought, to be, we ought to be worshiping God this way. Our, our civil magistrates ought to be obeying God this way. Our families ought to be obeying God this way. Fathers and husbands and mothers and wives, they're supposed to obey God this way. And our society is to be ordered this way. Come on, let's do that. And a bunch of reformers, a bunch of, and initially they were calling the Roman Catholic Church to reform. They were calling the Roman Catholic Church, let's obey God. And a bunch of them did and then got kicked out. Right? So that's how the Protestant Reformation happened. Um, but as, so as we do this, though, one of the temptations as you're, um, as you're recovering something really glorious from the past, and as we want to stand here with our, our sort of, um, uh, with our feet fixed um, here in the supremacy of God and the authority of his word, one of the temptations that sometimes overtakes reform types when they start doing this kind of work is, um, is they start, um, they turn into museum curators. Uh, they, they say, now you see this doctrine, John Calvin recovered it, and isn't that nice? Don't touch. Right? Um, and, but what we want to do is we actually want to live in this house. We want to live in this glorious house. And we don't want to just become the next museum curators. Or to change the metaphor, we want to fire these cannons at real modern enemies. Okay? Um, not, not merely polish them and rehearse how they were once used in the glory days of yore. Okay, when we're talking about true doctrine, true Christian doctrine is really just a distillation or a summary of what the Word of God says, right? That's, that's true Christian doctrine. It's just, a, it's just a distillation, a summary of what the Word of God says. And what's the Word of God? A sword. Sword. It's a weapon. It's a weapon for defending God's people and fighting off bad guys. It's a weapon. And my point here is it's not just a weapon to look at. Right? You don't say, oh, look, see this fancy sword that Athanasius used to fight off the Arians? Don't touch it. No. We want to so embrace these truths from the word of God that then we're enabled to fire the cannon. Right? There are modern enemies that need to be fought by the word of God, and there are sheep that need to be defended from them. And so that's what we want to do. By the grace of God, we want to apply these doctrines, these glorious doctrines, so we can live in this glorious house. So let's look at the text together. Um, having defended the absolute sovereignty of God over salvation, that's Romans 9. Romans 9 is God is Lord of salvation. He saves who he wants to save. He damns who he wants to, to damn. And who are you, O man, to question him? He's the potter. You're the clay. And then he proceeds from there to talking about how God is going to save the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, and, and, and that's Romans 10 and 11. And then here in our text, the apostle breaks into this doxology of praise for God's wisdom and knowledge and judgments. It's just, it's just, this is a mountain peak of doctrine. It's high doctrine of God's supremacy, his sovereignty, and having come to the sort of the pinnacle of that mountain, he just breaks out in praise. He breaks out in praise. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. And specifically, this wisdom and these judgments, he says, are unsearchable and past finding out. You can't get your head around this. It's so good, it's so amazing, you can't understand it. You, it, just, it just makes you go silent, it makes you go slack-jawed, it makes you just praise. And then uh, Paul poses three rhetorical questions in order to explain what he means. He poses three rhetorical questions, all of which assume negative answers. He says, let me, let, me, let me show you what I mean. Who has known what God is thinking? Answer, nobody. Who has known what God is thinking? Nobody. Second question, who has taught God anything? Answer, no one. No one has taught God anything. Third question, 
Who has given God anything such that God owed them something in return? Who has given something to God and, and such that he's got God on the hook? God owes him something back. Again, third answer, nobody ever. <laughs> That's the point he's making. That's the point he's making. And then his do- he has sort of a final doxology in which he's, he closes with this insistence that everything is from God, everything is through God, everything is to God and for God, which means that all the glory and all the praise and all the honor for all things belong to God. Amen. That, that's the doxology. That's his, that's his hymn of praise as he reaches the climax of this deep doctrine. One of the ways that the Reformation teaching is sometimes summarized is you'll sometimes hear it summarized under the heading of the solas. It's a Latin word for which means only, uh, sola, uh, and 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 things like sola fide means faith alone. Um, and, and but one of the solas that was often emphasized in the Reformation was soli Deo Gloria, right? Glory to God alone. Fundamentally, all the glory goes to God. And it comes from texts like this, that we want a theology, we want a practice, we want Christian lives where everything, all the glory goes to him. All the glory goes to him. Everything's oriented to him. Now, when we say that we want all that we do to be God-centered, when we say that we want everything we do to bring glory to God and be obedient to him, it's important to define which God we're talking about. It's important to define which God we're talking about. Instead of worshiping the true and living God, human beings are constantly twisting pieces of creation into idols that we call the true God. You know, most people that um, embark on idolatry don't, you know, they're not just like worshiping the true God of heaven. And then one day they're like, guys, let's worship that tree. You know, he made the heavens and the earth, but this tree is really big. People don't do that, okay? They don't, people don't, don't slip into idolatry by going like that. They don't just one day switch. How about this big rock? Let's worship it. Um, I made the statue. Let's worship it. And that's not how it works. What, what we do is, what, what sinful human beings do is, they've got the true God in mind, they've got the true God in sight, and then they think it would be a good idea to just make a slight modification. You know, I think it's like that only just a little. And initially when it happens, it's like, well, it's the same God. It's pretty much the same faith. It's the pretty, and it's hard to tell. And then it's a little, just a little bit more. And then just a little bit more. And, and it just, you're taking little things of what you think God should be like if you were God, this is how you would be. This, if, if you ran the universe, this is how you would run it. This is what makes sense to my little pea brain. And you try to attack, attach that to God. Right? But what are you doing? You're creating an idol. It's the true God watered down a little bit. It's the true God tweaked. Right? The, the name for this is syncretism. Syncretism is when you're worshiping uh, you're trying to blend with the true worship of God other, other um, elements, idolatrous elements. You're trying to mix it. And early on, it's hard to notice. Um, remember, this is what Aaron did with the golden calf. Uh, you know, the golden calf comes out of the fire, and Aaron doesn't say, hey, guys, uh, that was a nice run with that other God. Let's do Baal worship now. That's not what Aaron says. The golden calf comes out of the fire and he says, Israel, behold, the God who brought you out of Egypt. He's still telling the same story. It's the same salvation story. He hasn't changed soteriology at all, <laughs> except he has. <laughs> right? But he, he, he's, it's the same salvation story, only now he says, this is how you worship that God with this brand new golden calf. Um, Jesus is getting at the same thing in the Gospels. Uh, when he says, many will say to me at the judgment, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say, excuse me, who are you? Never met you before. You catch that? There are people, he says, who say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, who don't know him. 
Why? Because they, they, take, they have a name and they have a placeholder, but what they've done is they've evacuated who Jesus is, the God that he is, they've evacuated all that truth and they've imported into it their idea of what Jesus is, what God is, what Christianity is, and they worship an idol under the name Lord Jesus. Jesus says that's, that's gonna happen. There are gonna be people on the last day who say, Lord, Lord, we, we cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says, I've never met you. I never knew you, depart from me. And he says in that same place in Matthew 7, he says the difference between those who know him, and he knows, and those who don't, is between those who hear and obey and those who hear and don't obey. It's the same place where he talks about uh, the man who builds the house on the rock and the man that builds the house on the sand, right? And what's the difference? What's the difference between those two houses? The one who builds the house on the rock is the one who heard the word of God and obeyed. The guy who builds his house on the sand is the guy who heard the word of God and didn't obey, right? What does that mean? It means both guys went to church, right? Both guys went to church. Both guys went to PDGs. Both guys sang in the choir. Both guys had read the Bible. And one of them obeyed, and one of them didn't, right? That's the difference. That's the difference. So true obedience, that, what, what is it? What makes a man hear the word and say, eh, not that big of a deal. And the guy who hears the word and says, I've got to do that now. What's the difference? A true, deep, and abiding humility. That's the difference. A deep and abiding humility. Here's Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You hear that? There, there's, there's something fundamental at the very center of the Christian faith that says this, and, and I'm going to say this, and this, is, this, this, this sounds harsh, and it's the kind of thing that you're sometimes like, you know, well, be careful how you say it. And here's what I'm, this, is, this is fundamentally at the heart of the Christian faith, where the word of God comes to human beings, and it says this, shut up. Stop. You're made out of dirt. You just got here 15 minutes ago, and you're going to be dead in 15 more minutes. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Right? We, we do this with our own, our, I mean, you have a, a, a tiny little version of this with your kids, you know. Your, your, your two-year-old, you know, has some bright idea. And you're just, oh, that's cute, that's cute. I would never do that. That's a great idea, son. And it's like a million X between you and God. Your two-year-old has better ideas than you do for God. Right? That's facts. You, your, your ideas are, are nothing like his ideas. Your thoughts are nothing like his thoughts. Your ways are nothing like his ways. Right? As far as the heavens are above the earth are his ways above your ways. You know, we sent the Hubble telescope out, you know, and it's gotten like a couple inches into the universe. And we're like, but I think people have free will. I think we should worship like this. I, I, I heard this great song. I, why don't we do it like this? I've got this great idea. I've got this amazing idea. I think it should be like, I just don't think God would be like that. You know how absolutely arrogant that is? How absolutely prideful that is? I just don't think God would be like that. <laughs> Shut up. Shut your mouth. He made the universe and in his grace made you. And there you are standing on top of this enormous pile of grace and mercy and blessing saying, you need to listen to me. This is one of the fundamental Christian doctrines. Shut your mouth. He is God and you are not. He is God fall down, fall down, fall down on your knees, fall down on your face. What is it that makes somebody say, oh, that's an interesting idea the, the pastor said reading about, you know, whatever, uh, if, if you're lusting, you need to take care of that. You need to cut out that eye. Uh, I'll think about that. Who do you think you are? 
That's, that's interesting, that theory about God being in control of everything. Oh, I'll give that consideration. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He invented this whole universe, and he has given us his word. And we don't know what we're doing. We don't. We know the tiniest infinitesimal fraction of what there is to know. And we're like, well, I don't know about whatever. Submitting to my husband. I don't know about all that business about dressing modestly. I don't know about all that. I don't know about, that's just, it seems like you're making a big deal about something. Like, there's 66 books in the Bible. There could have been 180. God says, this is the word you need. This is the word you need. This is the word you need for everything. We're like, well, what does it say in the Greek? Shut up. <laughs> Who do you think you are? And th but that's the difference. Why, why does one guy hear it and won't build his house on the rock, won't obey? He's thinking about it. He's going to do a book study because he's arrogant. But the humble man says, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, and I mess up all the things I think are great ideas. Whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. That's it. Whatever he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it right away. As soon as I know that's what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to do it. Because he is God, and I am not. Because he is God, and I am not. This is what we might call the godness of God. The godness of God, his absolute lordship. He is the I am. He is the eternal existent one. He is the one who needs nothing, is dependent on nothing, exists forever in his own essence and perfection and holiness and delight. He needs nothing. He didn't need to make anything. And in his delight and in his joy, he created the universe and he rules it perfectly. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the governor of heaven and earth. And he does whatever he pleases. This is from Daniel 4. It says, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. I mean, compared to God, we are nothing. We're absolutely nothing. And among the inhabitants of the earth, None can stay his hand. None can say unto him, what doest thou? No, no, nobody gets to say, excuse me, God. <laughs> no, there's a fundamental fall on your knees. Right? Romans 9 again, he is the potter, you are the clay. Who are you, O oh man, to say, what are you doing? Fall down. But sinful men naturally think, this high view of God, this absolute sovereignty of God, this supremacy of God, this higher view of God makes man smaller and more insignificant. It, that's, what, that's, what, that's what the slander is. The, the heart of, of man says, well, if you go in for all of that, that's going to end up with people really getting degraded. We're really going to be, we're not going to be appreciated for what we are. We're not going to be protected for what we are, which is, incidentally, that was the, that was the slander of the serpent in the garden. The, the, the serpent in the garden said, basically, God's really great and all, but he obviously is not sharing some of that greatness with you. And so if you just slightly lessen how strictly you take his word, you will be wise like him. You will be great like him. You can get greatness if you just bring God down just a notch. I think, you, you know, you, they might have interpreted that verse wrong about not eating the fruit. Notice what that's doing, though. The offer is, the slander is God's withholding some goodness fr from you, particularly because of his word, be because of his supremacy, because of his majesty. And if you just bring it down a little bit, make him a little more approachable. Make them a little bit more understandable because, you know, God wouldn't want you to not to have something good. Like wisdom, isn't wisdom good? Knowledge of good and evil, isn't that good? And so what are you doing? You're, you're 
The serpent is offering you to think that God is more like the way you think God ought to be rather than the way he actually is, rather than according to his word that he's actually spoken. So the slander is that God is greedy with his greatness, holding us back, and therefore such a high view of God turns him and anyone who worships him like that into some kind of moral monster, withholding good, somehow crushing human beings. It can't, God can't possibly be like that. It doesn't make sense. But the exact opposite is actually the case. Every attempt to pull God down, every attempt to add to what God is, your own understanding, your own ideas about what makes sense to you, every attempt to do that always results in the degradation of creation. You don't actually get more glory. You don't actually get that wisdom. You don't actually become more like God. You become less like God. The more you degrade God, the more you are degraded. It is actually the utter transcendence of God that makes God able to condescend to man freely for our good. This transcendence, his utter sovereignty, his utter freedom to do as he pleases, and our absolute dependence upon him, it is that in which we find ourselves. You, you, you're, the most, you're the most like the man or woman you were made to be when God, in your vision, is as he actually is. Why? Because you're made in his image. And, and to the extent that you distort the image, you're distorting the glory that he intends to bestow upon you. So man stands the tallest when he lies prostrate before his maker. Man stands the tallest when he lies prostrate before his maker. This is what it says in 1 Peter 5. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Notice that. Where does the exaltation come from? It comes from humbling yourself not under just the hand of God, but under the mighty hand of God, the supremacy of God, the sovereignty of God, right? the freedom of God to do as he pleases. That's the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under that hand. Submit to that hand that he may exalt you in due time. But if you stand on your tiptoes, your you know, theological tiptoes, your intellectual tiptoes, your you know, whatever, your philosophical tiptoes saying, but I think this is, you're a little off here. This is what we've got to, we've got to correct. What are you trying to do? You're trying to pull God down. You're trying to remake God in your own tiny image. And in so doing, demanding that he give you something. Right? That's what you're doing. You're saying, if this doesn't make sense to me, it can't possibly be like this, it must be like this. And you're demanding something of God. And fundamentally, you're demanding he give you your life as though he owed it to you. And that's the way that you will certainly lose it. That's the, certain, that's the way you will certainly lose it. So, that's the doctrine. The doctrine is the supremacy of God, the majesty of God, that he does as he pleases in heaven and on earth, and his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are so high above us as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's the doctrine. What does it mean? Number one, it means that God is Lord of creation. God is Lord of creation. Nature is not infinitely malleable. Male and female is not malleable. Human sexuality and marriage are not malleable. Sin and righteousness, good and evil, these are not malleable. You, you cannot change these into whatever you want them to be. In the beginning, God created man in his image. Male and female, he created them, and these are fixed realities. No amount of hormones or surgeries can change this. Marriage is fixed, one man and one woman. Sin and righteousness is fixed. Good and evil is fixed, and you can't redefine it. You can't redefine it. It's, it's trying to fight gravity. It's like, it's like saying, well, we've decided that now uh, down is up and up is down. The world doesn't care, right? Because God made the world in a certain way, and he is Lord of creation. So you cannot redefine marriage as any sleeping arrangement you dream up. You cannot redefine justice as whatever the human judges decreed, right? No, no. 
that justice, that, that guy in that black robe just got here 15 minutes ago and he's gonna be gone in 15 minutes. He has absolutely no right to make up justice. The only thing that he can do, the only thing he can do with his five minutes of fame is point to the eternal decrees of God or else he is in defiance of the living God. That's what a judge may do because God is Lord of creation. And you cannot rename theft as just paying your fair share in taxes and government programs. No, you may not. It's called stealing, and it's stealing whatever you call it, however you try to rename it, because he is Lord of all of creation. He is Lord of all things because of him and through him and to him are all things. He is God. All the glory is his. Secondly, God is the Lord of lords. God is the Lord of lords. What do I mean? We don't use that word Lord so often except in more like church settings. But Lord of lords means Lord of all authorities. Lord of all authorities. Lord of lords, king of kings. We mean he's in charge of all human authorities. All human authority is derived from the Lord Jesus who was given all authority in heaven and on earth at his resurrection and ascension. That's what it says in Matthew 28. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go. All authority in heaven and earth means all authority in heaven and on earth, right? None accepted, right? All of it, which means that every lawful human authority has a boss. If you are a husband, a father, you have a boss. If you are a mother and you have authority over your children, you have a boss. If you are a pastor, an elder, or a deacon, you have a boss. It doesn't matter if they gave you a really cool, fancy hat you still have a boss, right? If you're a civil magistrate, you have a boss. If you're a police officer, if you're a judge, if you're a senator, if you're a president, if you're whatever, a prime minister, you have a boss. This means that all human authority is limited. If you have a boss, then you can only do what your boss says you can do. You don't don't get to run the company. You 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 don't get to make up uh, your job as you go along. No human authority is free to change, usurp, or abdicate their assignments from God. Only God has absolute, unlimited authority. All other human authorities are limited by God. There could be a whole message on all of this, but just very briefly, let me review for you. The family government has been given the duty, the assignment from God, the jurisdiction of taking care of the health of the members of the family, the welfare of those who can't take care of them, the disabled, the elderly, the sick, poor, and has been given the job of educating children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That is the jurisdiction of families. That is the authority that's been given to husbands and fathers in particular and wives and mothers as assistants. That's the government of the family. They are not free to do something different. They're not free to make something else up. That's that's not, uh, they're not allowed to. They have authority from the Lord Jesus. The church has been given the assignment of preaching the word, teaching the word, administering the sacraments, and conducting worship. This is the assignment of the church. The church may not uh, give itself a new assignment. The church may not turn into some kind of political action agency. The church may not um, start telling moms what cereal to serve their kids. That's not our business. It's not our jurisdiction, right? When it comes to breakfast, moms have more authority than pastors. Because right? that's a different, it's a different jurisdiction. It's a different power. And churches may not execute criminals. Right? We may declare what the word of God says to these other governments, but we are not to usurp our authority. Finally, civil magistrates, the state, they have a job, pretty much one job. And that job is to punish criminals as defined by God's word. That is their job. That is the assignment that Jesus the Lord of heaven and earth has given to them and nothing else, nothing else. They are not to take care of our education. They are not to take care of our welfare. They are not to come up with programs to help us paint bizarre paintings. They are not to stimulate our economy. They're not to have a space program. They're there to punish evildoers. That is their job. And in our day, Family and church governments have largely abdicated their assignments. You have family and churches not doing the things that we were assigned to do. You say, well, the the government schools are free. Yeah, because they stole money from you. 
right? But well, the, the health care benefits or the, whatever it is, right? It's not their job. Right? They're disobeying Jesus. They're disobeying Jesus, and to the extent that you're going along with it cheerfully, you're helping them. And the church, we, we're culpable for this too because you have, situ- you have society saying, you know, we've got all these family problems, this family breakdown, marriage breakdown. You know, uh, we, we need fathers spending more time with their sons. And then what is the next line out of somebody's mouth? I know, let's pass a bill. No, no. So they can take more money from you? So they can do the job that you're assigned to do, that the church is dis- assigned to do? We're the ones supposed to be preaching the word of God. We're the ones who know how to turn the hearts of fathers to children and the hearts of children to fathers. Yes, has there been massive breakdown? Yes. And the answer is the preaching of the word, the teaching of the word. The, 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 the answer is for the governments to do their jobs. So family and church governments have largely abdicated their assignments, and then civil government has usurped its assignment with a myriad of self-deifying programs claiming to be God, right? But that's... Fundamentally, when you say, I got this, and, 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 and just denying and defying the Lord, you're claiming to be God. A myriad of self-deifying programs in direct defiance of the living God. God is supreme. God is supreme. And his ways are high above our ways. And we have the audacity to say, well, yeah, but uh, we came up with a new program in the 20th century. Yeah, you and all the empires of the earth that are now in the dustbin of history. That's what happens. Either you submit to the king or you defy him and you're put down. The last thing, of course, there's lots of things that this all implies, but the last thing for this morning is simply this. When we meditate on these things, when we meditate on the supremacy of God, if we're doing it right, it's got to drive us to worship. It's got to drive us to praise. Worthy is the Lamb. When finite human beings are granted a vision of the greatness and the majesty of God, it is humbling, but it's a joyful humility, a doxological humility that falls down on its knees, falls down on its face, and then sings. Sings praise. It breaks out in grateful praise and worship. Every form of idolatry is a crushing weight. Every form of idolatry is actually a crushing weight. As you try to twist the image of God into something that fits a little bit more with what you can understand or what you can figure out, what you're actually doing is pulling your own noose tighter. You're making your own life more difficult and worse. But when you submit to the Lord of heaven and earth, deep gratitude, in deep gratitude, what you find is, is that this is what you're made for. When you fall down before God, you find that you're more human than you've ever been. You're more of a man than you've ever been, more of a woman than you've ever been. And that begins to permeate your marriage and your family and your community. It sets you free. And it sets you free when, when, you, when you recognize that God is Lord and he's supreme. One of the things it does is it, you realize, wow, I'm tiny. <laughs> I'm tiny. Yes. And it really sets you free just to be a person just to be you, you in God's gigantic world, the world that he's running for your blessing. And, and it's way better than you ever imagined. That, that's, what, that's what Paul says. When you realize that God runs everything, he is Lord, he is God, he is supreme, he does as he pleases, it sets you free, and there's a deep breath of ah, relief. I get just to be me. And you're free. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And amen. Father, we ask you to give us your Holy Spirit so that we might tremble with joy at your majesty. Father, show us where we need to apply these words specifically to our lives so that we would not be like the foolish man who hears glorious words and doesn't obey them. Let us be the wise man, Father, please, so we might build houses on the rock, that more and more of our lives will be more and more oriented to you and obedience to you. And we ask for this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, singing.
One of the things I've been talking with the elders and deacons about this week is why the Reformed churches have been so weak and impotent over the last hundred years or so. With some striking exceptions, the Reformed and Presbyterian churches have repeatedly capitulated to the cultural winds. From feminism in the early 20th century to no-fault divorce to the sexual revolution, how do Reformed churches, churches that subscribe to the same confessions of faith that we do, how do they end up ordaining women and flying rainbow flags? One of the central reasons has been a failure to apply God's word to specific issues in our churches, in our culture. Perhaps Reformed pastors and teachers have failed to do this out of fear and cowardice. Once you start applying God's word, you run the risk of offending people and getting in trouble like they did in the book of Acts. Better not do that. But that kind of fear demonstrates a failure of nerve or a failure of faith. And so the question is, what is it about our faith that has been so lacking? It's striking that Jesus repeatedly points to young children as the models for the kind of faith his people need. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom. While it's certainly not true for all, many in the Reformed churches have effectively said the exact opposite. Many have said, unless you become grown up and mature, you cannot come to this table. And the defense for that reluctance to welcome young children is fear that they might not believe, fear that they might not really understand, fear that God's promises won't be true. But Jesus says that little children understand better than many adults. I suspect that it's the same fear and doubt that's why many reform types are reluctant to apply God's word to all of life. What if it doesn't work out? What if we're wrong? But God promises to be our God and the God of our children after us. And faith means simply saying, thank you. Thank you not trying to figure it out, just thank him. In Colossians 2, 7, Paul warns specifically against being tricked by enticing words. So for us in our context, think feminism, Marxism, enticing words. And and it says that instead, we must be rooted and built up in Christ, established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. What kind of faith do we need? Faith that is abounding in thanksgiving. And so this is the charge. As you come, come with childlike believing faith, which is to say, come with faith abounding with thanksgiving for the way that God has promised to work in all the details of your life. Thank him that he's giving you your kids, giving you grandchildren that will walk with him, giving you this world. And so come, And welcome to Jesus Christ. The charge is this. Remember, you are very, very small. You're very small. And God is very great. He's very great. And that means one of the most fundamental gifts he gives is simply telling you what you need to do. We're the ones that make everything difficult and complicated because we want to understand it first. We want to explain it first. We've got grandiose ideas. It's a huge gift to remember. You're very small, and he is very great, and he knows exactly what you need to do. So obey him. Do what, do what he says to do. You're small, and he's great, and he has a blessing for you. So go with his blessing now. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who hath loved us and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through his grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And amen.